All right, we're on page 26 and following up the concept or the idea that idolatry is a focus on self, that, uh, that we looked at the golden calf uh, situation uh, with regard to um, uh, what the people said to Aaron and what Aaron said and how the focus was on the people rather than being on God. And I mean, before that, we noted this, this situation uh, in 1 Kings chapter 12 where Jeroboam played on the selfish desires of the people. And uh, you know, he, presented, he presented his idolatry as if he were doing them a favor. And how he used, he used religious imagery, he used religious terminology, uh, he made it sound a lot like what they had been told before, and so it was easier for them to it was easier for them to accept that uh, uh, by means of deception and slight changes, and uh, and so we're going to move into uh, the section that says the shift has changed from God to me, and I want to read this paragraph. I'm not going to don't want to insult your intelligence, but. Um, but there's some really good points in this, this paragraph. It says, Our consciences hold us guilty unless any worship or religious response to God has biblical foundation. And he says, At least most still have a conscience seeking biblical support. Now he's talking about the brotherhood. He's talking about the brotherhood. He's not talking about the religious world at large. He's, talking, he's warning us uh, about our propensity to serve self under the guise of serving God. He said, because most, you know, most congregations, most people will at least look for some scripture to support what it is that they want to do or what they believe they can do. And so, uh, so that's what he's talking about. He's not talking about the religious world in general, which by and large has completely abandoned any regard for what the Bible what the Bible says. Their, you know, their, their confession books, their creed books, their manuals, their catechisms, all of those things, their confessions of faith, all of those things take precedent over the Bible. And those are the guiding principles. Now, those books that they have may at times make some allusion to the Scriptures. But they themselves are not scriptures, and yet they are treated as if they... Actually, they're not treated as if they're scriptures. They're treated as if they were above the scriptures because the book takes precedence over... Their book takes precedence over the Bible. Then, then down says, As long as we have a smattering of support from any biblical text, many feel comfortable allowing such, which is... Basically, and I didn't read the, par the line before, but he's talking about changes to worship and, and matters of the structure of the church. <clears throat> that uh, that people, will, people will make some reference to some scripture uh, as, as, uh, as a proof or a text uh, to show why they can or should do a certain, a certain thing. In other words, if I can in some way find a passage then I can salve my conscience with that thing and proceed, uh, proceed with a clear conscience. He says, but, he says, this is a lie. This is a lie. And believing a lie is not a matter of small concern to God. Now, let me, I'm going to put something, I, I wrote something on the side here that I want to make, uh, I don't want to mention. With regard to finding a smattering of passages or, or, or biblical support. Uh, over the last 15 or 20 years at least, probably 30 now, uh, there have been a number of changes that have been made uh, in many congregations of the Lord's people. Uh, for example, you know, all the way back into the 80s, uh, some, uh, some of our brethren were appointing uh, women as elders. For example, I can cite you the congregation and the city if, if, if I have to do that. Um, well, I can just tell you, the Bearing Drive Church in Houston, Texas, did it 20 or 30 years ago, appointed women uh, as elders. Uh, any number of congregations uh, back then and even more now have introduced instrumental music into their worship. Uh, most of the time, they will add a service. Rather than just going full-blown instrumental, they'll add a service for the old people that doesn't have instrumental music 
And then they'll have another service for the people who want to have it. And the reason for that is they understand that the old folks are the money people. As a general rule, the old folks are the money people. And so as long as we can keep our old people happy and we can keep, we can keep the finances going through them, we'll, we'll, we'll placate them by giving them their service, but we're going to do another service that, that, you know, to placate you know, the, the, the millennial generation or, or the, the, younger, uh, the younger generations. But before those things are implemented, as a general rule, you'll hear our eldership say, we are restudying the matter of, and then fill in the blank. We are restudying the matter of exclusive male leadership in the church. We are restudying the matter of instrumental music in worship. Now, that is a lie. They are not restudying those matters. What they are doing is, is they're letting the congregation know, we've already made up our mind to do this. We're just trying to do one of two things. Find some plausible means why we can do this, while at the same time we're trying to dumb you down enough so that you'll accept it. Anytime you hear a congregation say, we are restudying the issue of instrumental music, we are restudying the issue of male leadership in the church. We are restudying the issue of marriage, divorce, and remarriage. We are restudying the issue of social drinking. Rest assured, mark my words, it won't be long until their studies contradict what they've been teaching for the last 100 or 150 years. I, mean, I know congregations now, and one in particular in, in Memphis, Tennessee, that openly, that openly endorses social drinking. Openly endorses. At church functions. At fellowships and church functions. I mean, that's, that's, where, that's where this thing is going. All right, so, but at some point in time, they've restudied that matter. And then they've they found some obscure text or, or or some idea that they think they can pawn off on their on the brother on their congregation and get them to accept it. Which, by the way, as a general rule, a lot of people in the church already want those things. So therefore, they're just going to give them. You know, they're going to throw them a line and say, "We'll get there soon enough." You know, just give us time to get the rest of them. To get the rest of them on board. Now that's that's the concept that John is talking about in this particular in this particular lesson. Uh, and then you well I'll give you another example. Uh, it has been extremely disturbing to me the way that our brethren have attached themselves to the Robertsons, the Duck Dynasty folks. You know, they you know those are our people. You know, they go to Watts Ferry Road or whatever the name of the church is down there in, in, uh, in West Monroe, Louisiana. And, and our brethren just went all a, all a flutter over, these are our people. These are our people. And then what do we end up seeing on the, on the television program? Bought a winery. Bought a racehorse. Gambling. All of those things. You know, Phil Robertson on, on record saying, I don't care if you take it. And he's an elder, by the way. I don't care if you take if you drink alcohol and the Lord don't either. By the way, you can find that quote online. All right? You know, those they have done more damage to the Lord's church in the last 10 or 15 years than any singular individual, any preacher or anybody that that I, that I can name. They've done more damage to the church because those people don't represent me. And I hope they don't represent you. And I hope they don't represent the majority of our people. But it hurts the church when, peop when people of, of fame uh, besmirch the church and, and, and say and do things that are not consistent uh, with what the Bible teaches. And so, uh, and the reason I mention that is because of letter B is that people think God doesn't pay attention to details. 
In other words, God, you know, this, God doesn't worry about the small things. You know, and you'll never find that in the Bible. You know, if, if anybody ever tells you that God doesn't, that God doesn't worry about the small things, the first thing I want you to do is define small things. Define small things. Then the second thing I want you to do is I want you to read the instructions for building the tabernacle. Where you read about 12 solid chapters of minute detail on how God wanted that tabernacle built. The size, the, the material that was used in the tent, the material that was used on, in, in the instruments, uh, the loops that were to be used uh, to, to hold up the curtains, uh, what they were to be made out of, and how many of them were to be on each side, what was to be on the corners, what kind of wood was to be used to hold up the curtain or metal to hold up the curtain. It is page after page after page of minute details. And then when you get done reading that, you're going to read almost the exact same text again, except where it says, you shall make it, end of discussion, end of sentence. It says, and they made it, word for word. No, in other words, you shall make it was replaced with, and they made it in every single detail. Now look, you know, I talk about different passages. You know, I talk about trying to read the, everybody needs to read the Bible through every year from, from Genesis to Revelation. And I understand, I understand that the reading about the instructions and the building of the tabernacle, construction of the tabernacle is not exactly uh, uh, exciting. It can be dull, but what do you learn? You learn God pays attention to the details. God pays attention to the details. You read about the genealogies in, in, the, in the early chapters of the book of Numbers, and you understand that being a part of a specific tribe and family was the very essence of being a Jew which I brought that up this past week with all the hostilities going on uh, between Israel and the Palestinians. And, and people are just, man, they're just end times in us to death on Facebook. They're just end times in us to death. The rapture is, I mean, a guy that I know and love, the rapture is near. The only problem is I've known that guy for 15 years. And you know what he says? He's been saying it for 15 years. Every time something goes haywire in the Middle East, the rapture's near. And so, but I brought up the very, I brought up this idea uh, of the of Jews knowing their lineage was the very essence of being a Jew. And there's not a Jew alive who can trace his or her lineage back to one of the original twelve tribes of Israel. That's why these things are important. That's why these things are in the Bible. Uh, for us. God cares about the details and God cares about the small things. I'll give you an example. In Zechariah chapter 4, beginning in verse 8, Zerubbabel came back and was rebuilding the temple of God. Now, who built the first temple? Who built the first temple? Come on, y'all. Who built the first temple? No! No! Solomon. Solomon built the first temple. David made preparations for the temple and in, in gathering supplies, but David didn't build it. He wanted to build it. God stopped him, and Solomon built it. Now, all right, that was, I guess, this is, this is going to be an easier question. What did Solomon cover that temple in? I thought that was an easy question. What did he cover it in? Gold. Thank you, Johnny. He covered it. In gold. I mean, it was an unbelievably magnificent edifice, okay? Now, Nebuchadnezzar came and he laid that thing just as flat as a flitter. And he carried off everything that was in it. He carried off all the gold, all the utensils, everything in it that was of any value. Nebuchadnezzar toted it back to Babylon. 
All right. Now here comes Zerubbabel. He's going to rebuild the temple. But rather than having a king like Solomon with unlimited financial uh, means building it, you've got a bunch of ragtag exiles who are only able to build it because Darius, in his benevolence and generosity, gave them the, the lumber and the things that they needed to rebuild it. But it was not going to be like Solomon's temple. And some of the people got discouraged because some of them were old enough to remember what the first temple looked like. They'd only been in exile 70 years. Okay? Some of them, some of them remembered what it, was, what it was like. And they got discouraged. And the problem was their faith was in what the temple was made out of as opposed to the God who was going to dwell in the temple. And Zechariah said in Zechariah 4, verses 8 and 9, he says, Who has despised the day of small things? Who has despised the day of small things? And he corrected the thinking of the people. It's not, it's not about what the temple's made out of. It's about the God who's going to dwell in the temple. And even though this temple in your eyes appears to be a small thing, God says it's a great thing. It's a great thing. And so God is concerned about the details. God is concerned about the little things. God is concerned about little things becoming big things. For example, in the Song of Solomon, chapter 2 and verse 15, the, the wise man says, Take guard and take care against the little foxes who spoil the vines. Now, aside from deer, John, all right? Aside from deer, who will destroy a garden in a heartbeat, what is, what is the number one, what would be the number one uh, means of damage to a garden? What would be the number one means? Bugs, insects, right? I mean, you get, you get insects, you get uh, Japanese beetles. You get, uh, you get worms in your corn. You know, you get, uh, you know, stink bugs. And all, you know, all kinds of things. Hornworms. You know, any, you know, another, any number, aphids. You know, any number of things that are very small can destroy a thing that is very large. And God was trying, through, through Solomon, was trying to help him understand that you have to guard against the small things. Look, you know, uh, straight line winds can knock your corn down, right? And we understand that. Now, what can I do about straight line winds? Not a thing. But what can I do about aphids? What can I do about jap beetles? What can I do about worms? You know, you know, I do, you know, in other words, I take care of the small things that I know that I can handle, and the big things will just have to be left up to God. But God is concerned, and God wants us to be concerned about the small things. Just one more, just very simple example. Cancer starts with a single cell. Isn't that right? Cancer starts with a single, how big is that cell? How big is that one cell? You can't see it with a human eye without help. That's right. So, what happens, what happens when a small thing becomes a bigger thing? It'll consume the whole, that's right. Left unchecked. So sometimes things can arise that we can't see at first. But then once those things are made manifest, do we deal with them or will we just let them go and just see what happens? Well, see, the same thing goes with our attitude toward God and the church and, and the organization of the church, the worship of the church, the work of the church, the life, the unity, the peace, 
the love that a church has. Sometimes things can arise that we can't see, but the moment those things are made manifest, God wants us to deal with them. Anything that can harm the church has to be handled. It cannot just be let go and just, you know, well, we'll just leave it alone and pray for the best. That, that's, not, that's, not God's, that's not God's plan. And so all of, these, all of these things that we're seeing manifest in the church did not start where they are now. They all started as small as small seeds. I have seen a congregation that I know and love dearly completely torn apart because there were some people in that congregation that had embraced what was called the change agent movement back in the 80s, which was seeking to change the church with regard to women leadership, instrumental music, marriage and divorce, etc. And the elders there did not have the courage to stand up and say no. And they let those people alone. And they were not content just for themselves to believe their error. They were intent on teaching and con making converts to their error. And it ended up being a tremendous, tremendous problem uh, for that congregation. Just, just about divided her right down the middle. And I don't mean the congregation of 60 or 70. I'm talking about a congregation of over 300. Those, you know, leaving the small things alone that are problematic is almost always devastating. Always devastating. So God is concerned about those things. God wants us to be concerned about those things. Then the bottom of page 26, he talks about and makes mention of um, you know, the popular idea that what we do in religion doesn't matter as long as I'm sincere and live according to my convictions. The top of page 27, it says, this is comforting. It is all-inclusive. It results in warm fuzzies for everyone, but it is evil error. He talks, he talks about the damaging philosophy, how damaging that philosophy is. Now, people will apply this philosophy to religion and their relationship with God, which is the most important thing that a man has. There is nothing that a human being has that is more important than their relationship to God. My relationship with my wife pales in comparison to my relationship to God. Now, my relationship with my wife can affect my relationship to God. So God expects me, you know, God expects me to treat my wife a certain way and, and, and take care of my household a certain way. But I do that because of my relationship to God, because it's first and foremost. And they'll apply this, it doesn't matter what you do or believe as long as you're sincere, to the most important thing that a man has and would not for a moment apply that principle in any other aspect of their lives. I'll give you an example. If I owned, a, if I owned no general store, and I sold cloth at that old general store. And I, my dad owned the general store before me, and his dad owned it before him. We'll just call it Clippers General Store. How's that? And people have been, trans, been doing business at Clippers General Store for over 80 or 100 years. And then the weights and measures man comes to my store to check my scales, and to check all my measuring units. And he goes, to the, he goes to the fabric table, and he measures my yardstick that I've got drawn out on the table, but I didn't draw it. My grandpa drew it years and years ago. And he says, your yardstick is only 35 inches. I know it says 36 inches, but the standard 36-inch measuring unit is an inch longer than your yardstick. Now, what is the response to that? Well, it was good enough for my dad, and it was good enough for my granddad, and they were both good and honest men, and I'm an honest man, and if it was good enough for them, it's good enough for me. Nobody's ever complained in the past about being shorted, uh, being shorted any fabric. Now, does my sincerity excuse the fact that it's only 30. Does it make 35 inches, 36 inches? 
Does the fact that my daddy and my granddaddy were both honest men, does it make it thir- did it make it 36 inches then? No. And anybody that was honest would do what? I'd make it right. I'd make it right. Or how about this? How about if you go to a store and somebody sincerely gives you the wrong amount of change back and uh, you paid with a 20, but they thought you paid with a 10 and they gave you change back from paying with a 10 instead of a 20 and they were honest about it. And you say, wait a minute, I, I gave you a $20 bill. Well, I, I thought you gave me a 10 and I sincerely believe that. So you just need to go on about your business. I'm, I sincerely believe you gave me a 10 and not a 20. Now, does their sincerity change the fact that they shorted me $10 worth of change? Am I just willing to accept the fact that it, it was an honest error? And I'm just going to walk away and I'm going to leave $10 there? Am I going to do that? Well, no, I'm not going to do that. But if what one does, as long as he's sincere, is, is acceptable, and you see how ludicrous this idea is. There's not one area of our lives where we accept that. I mean, like, if, if Jimmy's supposed to put a certain color of paint on a car, and he puts a different color of paint on the car, even if it's an honest, honest mistake, what are you going to do, Woodard? You, that's right. You're going to eat it. And, you, and what else are you going to do? I'm going to fix it and make it right. Your sincerity didn't change the paint color, did it? No. And so, well, not if you make it right necessarily. You're right, but the point is your sincerity didn't make it right. But being a person of integrity, you want to make it right. Got to be honest. All right. And so, and so, but people apply this standard to religion when they won't apply it anywhere else in their lives. And so, you, you, what, in other words, what you see is you see the inconsistency in the way they live and the incons- with the way that they practice their uh, religion. Uh, then down at the bottom of page 27, there's, uh, there are, are three passages of Scripture that speak to the matter of sincerity, and we might say the, the insufficiency of sincerity. With regard, for example, with regard to the matter of the Thessalonians in chapter 2, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And I'll begin reading in verse number 9. It says 10, but we need to read 9 because of the words that are in verse number 9. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. With all unrighteousness, deception among, and with all unrighteousness, deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Do you see how important it is to believe truth? If they believed truth, Paul said, they would be saved. But because they do not believe truth, but instead have been deceived in believing a lie and take pleasure in that lie, it says... They will all be condemned. Believing truth is paramount. Hearing, understanding, knowing, and believing truth is paramount to being saved. A person cannot be saved if they believe a lie. They cannot be saved if they believe a lie. They cannot be saved because believing a lie makes one unrighteous. Unrighteous. And then you have the second example there in 1 Kings 12 and 13. Now, we talked about this text last week in regard to the 
to the changes that Jeroboam the son of Nebat made to worship. Remember, he changed the day of worship, or he changed the object of worship, he changed the place of worship, he changed the day of worship, and he changed the priesthood of worship. And that's where we focused last time. But in chapter 13, God sent a young prophet to rebuke Jeroboam for the changes that he made in worship. And he, he made a prophecy about Jeroboam that did not come true for literally hundreds of years. Hundreds of years. But it did come true. And you can read about it. I believe it was in the days of Josiah that the prophecy came true. But the young prophet condemned Jeroboam for what he had done you know, by, as the mouthpiece of God. And God said, you go and you rebuke Jeroboam and here's what you say. And then when you leave, you don't go home the same way that you came. You don't stop and eat. You don't stop and drink. You don't do it. You go home. When you finish, you go home. So the young prophet rebuked Jeroboam. And Jeroboam told his men, stuck his finger. You can just see him sticking his hand out. Seize that man. And as soon as he did that, the Bible says his arm withered up. Scared him to death. And he pled with the young prophet. And the young prophet gave a word and guess what happened healed him in other words the young prophet proved that he was a man of God that his message was from God he did everything that God told him to do and then he went home and while he was on his way home an old prophet heard that he was traveling and he approached the young prophet and he said come over he said come on over come on over to my house and get about to eat and rest a while and the young prophet said, no, I can't do it. He said, God told me to go home a different way, not to stop, not to eat, not to drink, not to go into anybody's house. And the old prophet said, but God just spoke to me just a little bit ago. And he told me to come tell you this. And the text says what? But he lied to him. And rather than, than adhering to the counsel of God, the young prophet adhered to the counsel of the old prophet. And while he was sitting at the old prophet's house, the Holy Spirit came upon the old prophet. For real. He said, because you have disobeyed the voice of the Lord, you will not make it home. And the young prophet got up and left, and sure enough, just like the old prophet said, he was killed by a wild animal on his way home. See, it didn't matter that the young prophet had gone to Jeroboam like he was supposed to. It didn't matter that the young prophet had prophesied against Jeroboam like he was supposed to. That he had performed everything that the Lord had commanded him up to that point in time. The minute that the young prophet believed a lie, he was condemned. And the same goes for all of us. It doesn't matter how long we believe the truth. It doesn't matter how long we faithfully serve the Lord. The moment we begin to believe a lie, we do so to the forfeiture of our souls. Just like that young prophet. That's why believing the truth is so important. That's why I say time and time and time again while I'm preaching, look this up in your Bible. Read this for yourself. Don't take my word for this. You will give an account for what you believe. I will give an account for what I teach. But you will give an account for what you believe. And if I tell you something that's wrong and you believe it, I'll be responsible for that, but you will too. Because God has given us the means by which we can confirm or deny everything we hear in our Bible classes and our, in our pulpits. And so that's why it's so important for us, so important for us to believe the truth. All right. That's going to... I've kind of given the, the synopsis of the next four or five pages. of The next four or five pages are a synopsis of the situation with the young prophet, 
uh, uh, the situation with the Thessalonians. And I didn't mention uh, Matthew 15 with regard to the, the Pharisees. You know, they're blind leaders of the blind. And so, and there's no excuse. If they're blind, it's not, it's not their fault that I choose to be blind and follow them, is, is, the, is the gist there. So, so, Lord willing, next week, let's move, to, let's move to our next lesson on page 35. Next lesson on page 35. And we will start there, Lord willing, next Sunday morning.